Good morning. It's great to be with you. Would everybody say hi to Gamel and Sophia? Hi. Well, that was great. They're going to pray for us this morning. They're brother and sister. Gamel sits behind me uh, all every Sunday in first service. And last week I said, man, I want you to pray for us one day. And he said, well, can my sister help me? And I said, I think that'd be terrific. And uh, Gamel was in my group in VBS, and so was Sophia. And Gamel, <laughs> Sophia kept Gamel and I in line. So, would you guys pray for us this morning? Yes. Dear God, oops. Dear God, you are our savior, our hero, and our protector. There is no one like you. You are our greatest father, and we hope the poor people will get what they need. We believe you will make everyone's prayers come true and make loved ones. Thank you for making us, and thank you for making everyone special. I hope you all have a great day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Well, I'm glad that you're here. We continue to, to pray for everybody that's traveling. A lot of folks are traveling home uh, today, and school will get back in rhythm for most people tomorrow, and I'm anxious for everybody to, to get back and be, be home. So a lot of our staff have been traveling as well, and some in Hawaii. I mean, who knew that Trisha was actually from Hawaii? Crazy. It's a tough adoption here in Ohio from Hawaii. We're going to continue in the R Value series this morning, and in this series we've looked at a lot of, a lot of pieces of the puzzle that, that make us who we are, but I, I want to step back and I want to look at our why. Why does a church exist? Why is a church important? Why does a church matter? Why do I make these crazy statements like this, that I believe the local church is the most important entity around the world wherever it's at? I make those statements because I really believe it's true. And I believe every local church has an expression of the kingdom to be lived out where they are for the advancement of the cause of Christ. So the local church is important. And our why here at, at the Refinery Church is this. We exist to help people love and follow Jesus for life. It's really not that complicated, but it really is that specific. When you think about the word life, I, I've had a, an acronym for the word life for a long time, living intentionally for eternity. We exist to help people love and follow Jesus for life. I don't think you really love Jesus if you're not following Jesus. That's a pretty bold statement. I don't think you really love Jesus if you're not following Jesus. Because the Bible, the Word of God, is pretty clear on what it means to follow after God. And the following is the byproduct of the loving. Matter of fact, when big crowds would gather around Jesus, he would make these crazy statements that would lead to a lot of people not following Jesus. Right? So why do we want to focus on helping people love and follow Jesus because I believe that heaven matters and I believe hell is real and I believe hell is hot and I believe there is a separation. I believe there's a separation for all eternity for those who face eternity without a relationship with, with God. And Jesus made these bold statements in John 14, 6. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father. I think he's really clear and I think that's really important. And I think if we're going to be a mission-centric church, we've got to understand our why always. It should always be in front of us. Any organization that, that ceases to remember their why will soon drift in their mission. And then you hunt with a shotgun instead of a rifle, right? So if, if our mission is our why then our values are the how. How are we going to do it? How are we going to help people love and follow Jesus for life? Well, it's simple. And we've been camped out in these for a while. Next week, we'll, we'll wrap it up. We're going to do it by, by valuing God and others, loving God, loving others. Loving God means we love others. A great commandment and the great commission compel us to love God and to love each other. We're going to value, uh, not grave, that should be grace. Uh, don't take a picture of that. 
we're going to value grave over guilt. <laughs> that doesn't, yeah, we'll change that for next service. Yowzers, there you have it. That would be my fail. Grace over guilt. We're going to value grace over guilt. Grace helps you grow. Guilt helps you die. Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense, the opportunity to give people what they're not deserving of. We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to give what we've received, and we're going to give grace for growth, not guilt for, for punishment. We're going to value truth with kindness. All truth without kindness is, uh, is dangerous. All truth without kindness is bullying. All kindness without truth is enabling. So we're going to value truth with kindness. We're going to value serving sacrificially. We're not going to believe that on the, on the altar of comfort is, is our highest mark of service as a church. Jesus made some bold statements like, The greatest among you will be the servant of all. Jesus modeled in the upper room what it means to serve when he washed the disciples' feet. And he said, You've seen me do it, now that's what you ought to do. What was he doing? He was living out a metaphor in a very dramatic way to say this is the, this is the disposition of, of really the culmination of the gospel. It's loving me in a way that loves others, and it moves us to serving sacrificially. We're going to value biblical teaching. We're going to look at the Word of God and apply the Word of God to every area and every complication of our life. We're going to believe that the Word of God is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and and growing in all things that are worthy biblical teaching and we're going to value intentional relationships and that's where we'll we'll spend time today and next week we're going to talk about the next generation but intentional relationships and and we touched on it last week when my friend bill was here who spent the last 25 years in eastern europe with campus crusade and was the regional director and, and some of you came to the evangelism uh the conversation Wednesday and we'll have another one in April and another one in May uh, talking about how to connect people with with the heart of Jesus how to connect our story with his story so other people can experience their story in, in Christ but when we think about intentional relationships um, I don't think all intentional relationships are healthy but I think all healthy relationships are intentional I don't think all intentional relationships are healthy, but I do think all healthy relationships are intentional. So when we say intentional relationships, we mean healthy, life-giving, hope-stewarding relationships, right? Have you ever seen an intentional relationship that wasn't healthy? Have you ever been in an intentional relationship that wasn't healthy? Did you ever pray that God would work out the bad relationship you were in, and then after you were out of it, you thank God that that didn't work out? Because you were in a, in a place that wasn't healthy either, right? I, if you show me your friends, I, I said this to thousands of teenagers, and I continue to say it to teenagers when they want to listen to me. If you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Why do we want healthy, intentional relationships to be a core value of our church? It's simple. If you, have, if you have unhealthy relationships that are the closest relationships to you, pretty soon you become an, un, an unhealthy person. If your closest circle, or, or in the Greek they call it oikos, circle of influence, is unhealthy, you become, um, you become unhealthy. If, if you hang around a lot of people that talk about other people, pretty soon you'll start talking about other people. If you hang around people that, that have shallow values, pretty soon your values, no matter how high, will become deteriorated. Because what Paul tells us, tells the Corinthian church, bad company corrupts good morals. So why do we want to talk about intentional relationships and healthy relationships? As it relates to the body of Christ, as it relates to who we want to be as a church. Because I think they're the lifeblood to seeing a mission fulfilled. I don't think the mission of God will ever be fulfilled by the people of God if the people of God aren't interested in having healthy relationships, intentional relationships. So healthy relationships have some commonality. 
and we'll, we'll take a look at, at some of them. This isn't an exhaustive list, uh, but it is, I think it's a good start. Intentional relationships that are healthy require honesty. Have you ever had a friend say something to you that, that hurt, but you knew it was right? If you've had that friend, then you have a good friend indeed. If you haven't had that kind of friend, then, then you should ask yourself the question, what is it about me? What, what is it that, that I project that doesn't give people permission to speak truth into my life? You know, it's really hard to be honest with somebody that's primarily defensive. It's very hard to be intentional with somebody that doesn't want to grow. It's very difficult to help somebody see what they're unwilling to notice, even when, in honesty, it's pointed out with truth and kindness. See, all these values dovetail into the reality that intentional relationships are the requirement for, for a missional movement of God's people to advance his agenda on earth. But it's hard to have healthy relationships without honesty. I like what Proverbs 20 Twenty-seven six says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy, they just tell you what you want to hear. They manipulate you. They use whatever, whatever means necessary is what the Proverbs writer is saying. Wounds from a friend can be trusted only if you allow yourself to have deep relationships with trusted friends. But a, a friend will never, will never wound you for your good if they don't believe that you're willing to grow. You know, healthy people will, will start to walk away from unhealthy people. You get that, right? Amen, Pastor. It was good to come to church this morning. I'm glad I woke up. It's difficult to stay in a relationship with somebody that doesn't want to get well. It's difficult to tell somebody the truth if they're consistently unwilling to hear it. I distance myself from people that don't want to grow. That's just true. It's a natural inclination of my heart to distance myself from people that don't want to grow and be honest about, about life. Because life is short and time is limited, right? Wounds from a friend can be trusted. They're like surgical scalpel incisions that are good for your growth. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branch in John 15, and my father's a gardener. Any, anyone who remains in him, those that produce fruit, he prunes, right? Those that don't, he cuts off and he throws them into the fire. See, there's something beautiful about the pruning work of God. There's something beautiful about the, the surgical wounds of a friend that are meant to help us grow further and go faster in the areas that are worth arriving. But if all we do is hang around people that endorse our bad ideas and put up with our unholy complaining all the time, we're not going to grow. We're going to circle. It's sort of like going to the airport and just driving around it and never getting on the plane to go to the new destination. Healthy friendships, intentional friendships have to operate in honesty. And honesty is a give and take in a healthy relationship. The second thing is this. Healthy relationships offer consistency. Hebrews chapter 10 uh, has this to say about consistency. It's interesting. The Hebrew writer says, let us consider how we may spur. You know, spur, it gives you that image. Cowboys wore spurs, right? Do you know what spurs were for? to get the attention of the horse, to provide just enough pain to get progress, to provide just enough stimulation to have movement. 
the Hebrew writer says, let us consider how we may get just enough tension with one another, spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Not giving up meeting together. You need consistency with honesty. You need, you need community. One of the reasons that life groups are so important around here is because the reality is most churches today in, in North American culture have failed to make disciples, but we are, are okay at filling buildings, although that's declining too. And, and we know that, that you don't grow in rows, you grow in circles. See, you can be inspired in these rows, but you'll really go deep in a circle. Does that make any sense? And one of the things that I think is really important is if you're gonna if you're gonna grow and you're gonna take growth seriously, then you have to have consistency. If I go to the gym once a week, which I don't even do that, but if I went to the gym once a week, I would be the worst participant in a bodybuilding contest. Could you see that? Wouldn't that be hilarious? Somebody signs up for the Arnold who went to the gym once a week and didn't monitor their diet. Wouldn't that be hilarious? Matter of fact, I dare one of you. See me afterwards. I'll help with your sponsorship. It'll make a great illustration. But, but there's this real unfortunate reality that we think in North America that, that this, this Christianity, this idea of following Jesus can be casual and that we don't have to be consistent and we can come and go as we please and, and we don't really need accountability and we don't really need to be to be called out when we're out of line. And a matter of fact, if you call us out when we're out of line, we're going to distance ourselves because we really don't want to grow. I've said it before, I want to say it again. One of the most dangerous things you can do for your children is to be inconsistent in church attendance, but yet try to act like it's a priority. One of the, one of the most dangerous things you can do for your children's faith is to be inconsistent in matters of faith, but then verbalize as if it's a priority of your life. There's research, Pew Research just came out with a survey, and... Uh, the results of that survey were astonishing about the detriment that it has to do with raising kids in a nominal Christian environment to their faith. Listen, church, I love you enough to tell you the truth. Don't be nominal. Jesus didn't die so you could be nominal in the things of God. He died so that you can be fully alive in the things of hope. He died not so that when you, he, he didn't give his life so you could get saved so that when you die you go to heaven and that's it. He died so that you could come to life right here and heaven comes to earth and you begin this incredible journey and then when this life is over you transition into glory. It's not some hope deferred, it's hope right now. And if we live in this hope deferred, if we live in this, well, I'm just going through the motions, that's one of the greatest tragedies of how the gospel has been presented in North America. It's this hope deferred gospel. This, you know, I prayed this prayer. Now I can do anything I want and God's not really that interested. And when I go to, when I die, I go to heaven. I don't know how you make that leap theologically given the word of God. That is a pretty dangerous way to live your life. Intentional relationships require consistency your intentional relationship with God requires consistency. Your intentional relationships with each other, whether it's friend or, or life partner in marriage, it requires consistency. Do not give up consistency. Man, it's important. Spur one another on. I want to challenge you. If you're not in a life group, get in a life group. 
I want to challenge you. Because life groups are designed to be places where, where you can talk about things in a safe environment and others can give you perspective based on the word of God and they can love you in the process. That's what life groups are meant to be. And I hope you'll get in one. Intentional, healthy relationships are mutually respectful. Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. They're mutually respectful. They're give and take. It's not a one-way street. They want the best for each other. They, they in, in humility, consider the other's best more important than themselves, right? That's what healthy, intentional relationships do. They're mutual in benefit, and they're mutual in respect, and they're mutual in submission. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, right? It's not my way against your way, it's our way. And then he goes into the, into the wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives, right? That whole understanding. But they're mutual, in, in respect. Healthy, intentional relationships operate with empathy. Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. You know, sympathy is the ability to feel for somebody. Empathy is, is the ability to feel with somebody. And, and close friends, intentional friends, intentional healthy relationships, when, when you hit something in life and you have a close, trusted friend, when you hit something in life, they don't just feel bad for you, they walk through it with you, right? When you hit something in life, intentional friendships, healthy friendships, they don't just tell you what to do, they roll up their sleeves and say, let's get after it together. What do you need? I'm here with you. You don't have to go, by, go alone. It's not just a sympathy card, it's a, I'm all in. How can I help, right? I think we've lost the art of empathy. It's easy to click the sad face on Facebook without being moved to any action, right? If you've ever had friends, true friends, that, are, that have empathy for what you're living in or going through, then you're a blessed person indeed. Intentional, healthy relationships, they cover a gamut of, of areas of life. They walk with you. They don't just instruct you. Intentional relationships make us better. They make us better. Proverbs 27, 17 says this, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. They make us better because they surface the friction. They make us better because they call out the tension and often require it. Intentional, healthy relationships, they don't avoid the difficult things. They don't avoid the hard conversations. They don't just explain away the disagreement. They don't just cover it up and act like it never happened. Intentional, healthy relationships go to the pain they don't just walk away easy don't you don't you want relationships like that see I think we want those relationships I just don't think we want to pay the tuition required see I think we all want great marriages but somehow we think great marriages just happen. Every great marriage I know of has required an incredible amount of work, including the one I'm in. Every, every healthy, intentional relationship I know of requires a lot of effort. It requires transparency. It requires trust. It requires time. It requires energy, it requires preference, and it requires effort. Everyone I've ever been in. I have a great deal of acquaintances. But 
But my true trusted friends, they make me better because they, they call me out when I'm out of line. Some of you are in this room. I'm really grateful for that. Some are a distance away because they were different parts of different chapters of my life. I'm really grateful for them. I have a friend in Atlanta named Tom. We've been friends since we were in youth ministry together. He was a youth pastor for a while. And, and we ran some camps together and took kids to NYC, Nazarene Youth Conference. We, we ran that together. And, and I've not lived in Atlanta for 16 years, but Tom and I talk about real life stuff. Like every time we're on the phone together, this is the kind of conversation we have. After we laugh about 15 different things, before we're ever off the phone, hey, how's Millie? How's Noah? How's Bethany? And, and the same. They'll ask about Melissa, Nathan, and Rachel. And when our kids are going through different things, we pray for each other. We pray for each other to have wisdom, but... You know, if, if we didn't feel like we could truly be honest about what our kids were going through, we would never be able to. Does that make sense? I'm convinced life is too short, hell is too hot, eternity is too long not to have intentional, healthy relationships. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And I'm also convinced that to love God with all your heart is going to require doing it in a community of believers where you're intentional to lean in with others toward the heart of God and you're going to trade paint and have friction along the way and iron will sharpen iron in the process. And if that's going to happen, you're going to have to be less offended. We live in one of the most easily offended cultures on, in history right you get that too maybe I'm just getting old and I'm just going to start shooting everything I think maybe that's where I'm at I don't think you can be healthy if you're easily offended mature people aren't easily offended And if you want to have healthy relationships, you have to make a commitment to yourself to maturity. Does that make sense? Not a, not a commitment to perfection, a commitment to maturity, a commitment to a process of growth along the way so that you can allow others to speak into your life in those moments and you can allow the Holy Spirit to speak through others into your life, into those places that are strategic for your growth, where they can apply the Word of God to the, to the situation you're living in. It's not my greatest desire to offend you every week. It is my greatest desire to present the word of God to you in a, in a manner that you can apply it to your life every week. And I'm convinced that this world needs the church healthy this world needs the church holy. This world needs the church intentional. And this world needs the church on mission more than it's ever needed it in my lifetime. It needs it now. And the church isn't a building, it's us. It's us. With all of our weirdness, with all of our uniqueness, with all of our complexities, with all of our gifts, with all of our talents. It's this weird menagerie, this weird melting pot of people who God loves and calls together to be the church. And he needs us. The world needs us. So I want to encourage you and I invite you today to be intentional. To be intentional. 
Growth is rarely the byproduct of comfort. You won't, you won't comfort your way to growth. You won't comfort your way to maturity. You won't comfort your way to, to raising kids intentionally. Right? You just won't do it. So I, wanna, I just want to leave you with this challenge, this encouragement, this spur to make a commitment today to drive a, a stake in the ground of commitment today to the Lord and to yourself that you're not going to stay where you are. You're going you're to be on a journey to grow from this point forward the rest of your life. That you're going to be intentional in your relationships and that you're going to seek for those relationships to be healthy. That you're going to confess what you need to confess to people and give them permission to hold you accountable. Good friends don't use your confession as a billy club to beat you up. Do you know that? Look, some of you in the room, you're afraid to trust people because you've been hurt by others. I get that. Some of those wounds run really deep. I understand that. If you're, if you're fearful to trust, I pray that you will just allow God into that area of your life and give him permission to speak into that pain so that you can have newfound trust in, in your present. The enemy wants you to, to avoid healthy relationships. One of his greatest goals in life is to keep you in the area of, of avoidance and distraction. And he'll use your past hurt to keep you avoiding present hope. He'll use your past relationships to keep you from leaning in to purposeful relationships today. And when we operate in our past pain, we often use people instead of embrace people. When we operate in our past pain, we often use people instead of embracing people. Does that make sense? It's a really unhealthy model of friendship and relationship. I'll pray and then we'll, we'll wrap up with worship. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that, that your word is truth. I thank you that your word is hope. Your word gives life. I thank you that the, the Bible is filled with wisdom. And I thank you that, that your Holy Spirit enables us to have deep understanding of your love. And Lord, I pray that if anybody in this room has never experienced the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would do a new work in this moment in their life. I pray that you would instantaneously do a work of your presence in their life, your spirit in their spirit, and that they would receive the power that comes from being connected to you in a meaningful way. And that having received that, they would move forward in their journey with you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that if for people in the room that are operating with past hurts, that you would replace those hurts with hope. I pray that you would replace that pain with purpose. And I pray, Lord God, that you would, you would give them the ability to trust like never before. And Lord, I pray that this would be a church that is open and connected. That we're open to, to others and we're reaching out and we're seeking to help others find hope in you, Jesus, that they would come to love you and follow you for life. And I pray that those of us that are part of this church would be meaningfully connected one to another in ways that bring glory to God and freedom and life to us as iron sharpens iron that we would be able to trust what's hard to hear but is good for the soul that we wouldn't be people that, that talk about others 
that we would be people that talk to others. That we would embrace Matthew 18, that if we have anything against one another, first we would go to each other so that we may preserve the unity in the body of Christ. Lord, I pray for our zip codes in Upper Arlington, Dublin, Hilliard, Galloway, the parts of Columbus that are infused in all of this area. Lord, I just pray that you would give us eyes to see those that are hurting and a heart to care for those that we encounter and and the overwhelming love of God to share with everybody whose path we cross. I pray that you would send a revival and wake up those that were formerly awake to, to your hope and your truth. Father, I pray you'd send a revival in, in 40-year-olds that, that prayed a prayer at a, at a church camp somewhere or at a VBS somewhere, and now they're, now they're in their 40s and 50s, and, and they've just drifted so far from God, and they're not intentional at all. I pray that you would send a Holy Spirit revival that would begin to wake up the sleepers and that they would be renewed in their hope. God, I pray that you would do a new thing in our day, in our time. We love you and we thank you. In the mighty name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Okay, so here's a challenge for this week. Take some time. Maybe it's just a sticky note, but I would make it more than a mental note. Make a note in your phone. And list the friends, the healthy, intentional friends that you have that speak truth so that, so that it, it brings life to you. Does that make sense? Make a quick list. And then shoot a text to every intentional, healthy friend that you've got. Does that make sense? And just thank them. Thank them. And then say something like this. If I can ever add value to your life, please don't hesitate to reach out. Give an open invitation for them to reach your direction when they need something too. Cool? Awesome. As you stand to worship, let me me just share this with you. Out on the the, uh, cart in the foyer are these little cards are kind of small on the back it says let's celebrate and uh, they're Easter invitations you can take them use them give them to your friends Uh, I just would ask that you don't litter and leave them on the ground but you can put them put them around where people will see them right Uh, I believe the resurrection of Jesus is worth celebrating I believe that people need to know his truth I believe that healthy churches are an anomaly in America and I believe we've got room for more amen amen let's stand let's worship God bless you church